listeners, and welcome to the latest episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I remain your host, Jason Johnston Yellen, and staring back at me from FaceTime within my iPhone is Joshua Morrissey Hatton. Hello, Joshua. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. I am I'm excited mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. as as regular listeners know, in Extra Extra, you or I bring a recent whiskey-related news story to the attention of the other. We read it in the first half, we riff on it in the second half, and mm-hmm. we always get out of here in a tight 35. Always. Always. And, and one of my favorite times is when you're the man in charge of bringing this story to my attention. All right. So, so I'm excited to see what you brought. However... Before we get into today's article, we did want to do a little bit of housekeeping from the last episode where we were we were very excited in covering the the new comments period for the designation of American single malt whiskey as a defined category. Oh my gosh, every single whiskey dork listening to this right now, you just mentioned TTB and proposed comment periods and American single malt, and they're like, fuck, give it to me, give it to me. There's a lot to get excited about. I'm surprised you're telling me we made a mistake or maybe two mistakes. What 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 sort of housekeeping, cleaning are we doing here, Jason? Yeah, I, I'm certainly not going to attach the word mistakes to housekeeping. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just revisiting some of the uh, some of the spaces we left open. There you so, go. in our last episode, we we made reference to Amanda Beckwith, who's with uh, Virginia Distilling or Distillery Company, Joshua. It's Distillery Company. Because normally I would look at the sample bottles on my desk at this point so that I would get it absolutely spot on. Oh, yeah. You're traveling. That's why you sound different than usual. I do. Yeah. I yeah. sound like I'm calling in from outer space because I'm calling in from outer space. Not from Uranus? <laughs> the low-hanging fruit is the sweetest. <laughs> <laughs> and not hanging out of, you know. Um, so, so we are going with Virginia Distillery Company. Are those dingleberries, the low-hanging fruit? (laughs) I'm glad you chuckled at your own (laughs) juvenile Someone's got to laugh at my jokes. Anyway, please continue. (laughs) Yes, Virginia Distillery Company, Amanda Beckwith. So Amanda wrote in, you and I have been making mention in the last episode about blending materials Mm. and what what role blending materials might have. And so... Yes. Can you before you go too deep in here? Can can we just really, really quickly remind our listeners of the proposed guidelines to American single malt? I'll throw some of them out there really quickly, right? Like it's one hundred percent malted barley. It's uh, distilled at a single distillery. It can be matured in casks other than new charred oak. That that's a new thing. Right, um, and uh, matured in casts no larger than 700 liters, right? So that, that meets what the rest of the world is doing. There is no stipulation on minimum age statement put forth. That is correct. And then the, the other thing, and, and this is the part that you're getting to, right? Um, while it can't be flavored, there, there's this little bit about, you know, caramel coloring being okay, but then there's sort of these, these like blending components that, that are potentially permissible. And that's something that's kind of, that's what you're referring to in this comment here, right? Yeah. And, and one aspect, if, if we're talking about housekeeping here, everything that was covered in the last episode is up for discussion. It's not necessarily part of the final designation. And so there are comments being solicited for a range of aspects of what would then become the designation. So so Amanda, as we'd, we'd mentioned here, VDC, uh, said, good morning, which is very decent. That's a lovely way to open a text, especially because I was on the West Coast and it came in at 5 a.m. local time. That is the morning. She says, I've recently done a bit of research on quote-unquote blending materials 
as that was not one of the components the ASMWC had advocated for. And Joshua, I know you always like filling in the acronyms for people. So ASMWC? American Single Malt Whiskey <laughs> Cataclysm? Commission? Commission. 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 So it wasn't part of the original, right? Apparently, this is Amanda, it's par for the course for the TTB and covers any distilled spirit before extra designations can kick in to preclude blending materials. Hmm. And she says that is, you know, straight, right? So straight whiskies that we're familiar with uh, within the, the American realm. Right, and, and, and that's the other thing that I wanted to add, too. There was nothing in these um, designations that said we can or cannot use straight, the, you know, the term straight or the term bottled and bond, which are very common to American whiskeys. There's no talk about it, but it sounds like there's nothing against it either. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. All right. Continue. And so she says, I know you were discussing this on your last episode, so I thought I'd share the geekiness. I've never used blending materials for whiskey but it reminded me of a training I once had hmm. on Boise for cognac. Uh, which we've talked about previously uh, in the podcast with uh, our friends at Catoctin Creek, who you're wearing their shirt, right. by the way. <laughs> it's a day of the week that ends in Y, so I'm in a Catoctin Creek t-shirt. <laughs> and then uh, Amanda sent over Chapter 7. Uh, from the ttb.gov uh, <laughs> regulations. And it is, th this is the type of thing that our, our very own Jess Lomas loves reading through and is definitely a type of thing, if you are having any difficulty getting off to sleep at night, this is something <laughs> you should really uh, call up on your iPad. Yeah. For example, FD&C yellow number five is added to straight bourbon whiskey. The resulting product is no longer straight bourbon whiskey. The product is now a distilled spirit specialty and must be labeled with a statement of composition such as straight bourbon whiskey with FD&C yellow number five added. Wow. Okay. So, all right. So the, the comment there is you can put in blending materials, but if we're to take a cue from chapter seven here, it's saying you can use them. You just have to list it out. You have to, you have exactly. to mention it. Okay. All right. Exactly. And I think one of the things you and I were talking about in the last episode, maybe we're talking about it with the record button hit. Maybe we were talking about it without the record button hit, but the, the idea being for something like chill filtration and additional coloring mm. in Scotland, it's sometimes the case if you don't chill filter and you don't add color, you put on your label that you don't chill filter and you don't add color, mm -hmm. but nobody is going the other way. Nobody is saying, hey, we chill filter and that's on our label. We add color and that's on our label. Unless you're in Germany, where the laws state you have to list if they're... We, it doesn't necessarily stipulate you have to list chill filtration, but if you're adding coloring of any sort, that does have to be listed on the label. Right. There you go. So, yep. it's, so, it's, so it's interesting seeing those parallel moments and then those separate moments. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I, I like in this commenting period, if coloring does end up being allowed... Now, without overcomplicating the issue here, it's not like American single malt whiskey is going to have a straight designation. Right. 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 So could you add the color and not have to put it on the label? That is a really excellent question. It, it makes me think of, in a slightly tenuous way, it makes me think of the time we sent a label to the TTB and we listed that the whiskey was non-chill filtered, all natural color. The all natural color meaning that there was no color added. The, the color that you see of the whiskey is completely natural. The TTB took that as us saying, we have added a natural colorant to the whiskey. So, right, so it really, it does bring up some questions on how 
they would need to classify it, if at all, that that coloring is added. Well, and the fact that in this comments period, you can see what is and is not important mm-hmm. to consumers, mm-hmm. to others within the industry. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what type of response comes from the comments being made. Yeah. So, yep. so, so there you go. So I was, I, was, I was glad to get that text from Amanda. We, we have a, some conversations with some other folk. Uh, in the industry and associated with the with the commission, but we're not ready for a, a full statement from them just yet. Right. So, well, firstly, thank you for for bringing that up. It was it was good to add a little color to last week's episode, which, or not last week's, but the last extra extra, which was really a popular download for us. So. Are, are we ready to move on? Because I've got this article yeah. that I that I thought was really cool. So this is from the Rob Report. And it came out uh, August 10, uh, written by one Jonah Flicker. And the headline states, A long, shuttered whiskey distillery is returning with an uncommon floral scotch. Mm, Okay. Floral, you have my attention with floral here. Oh, same, 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 same. Uh, the subheader, the reborn Rosebank will make a lowland style of whiskey, starting with a 31-year-old distilled before it closed in the 1990s. So that's interesting. It'd be hard, it'd be hard to distill it after they closed, to be honest. With that attitude. Um, but it is kind of interesting that they're releasing a 31-year-old as a, hey, we're back. Am I remembering correctly that they had a 30-year-old release last year? I think so. Yes, you are remembering correctly. I remember oh, there cool. was a 25-year-old too, but that was probably from five years prior to that. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe before it changed ownership. Uh, but anyway, this is too much riffing, Joshua. Let's yeah, get on with the reading. Let's so, stay focused. You're, you're going to like the way this kicks off. Scotland Ooh. is haunted. But it's not just ancient castles with gosmer wraiths flitting around the dungeons and hallways. There are many ghost distilleries as well. But recently, some of these abandoned whiskey-making sites are being reanimated after decades of moldering. I really like uh, the style that Jonah has here. I, I want to take out my D20 and, and, and start killing orcs. Anyway, one of the latest is Rosebank, a distillery in the lowland region of Scotland that is lesser known but has some excellent whiskey to offer, including this new rare 31-year-old single malt. The lowland region is known for producing a lighter, more floral style of whiskey, according to many experts. The number of distilleries in the area might be dwarfed by its neighbor Speyside to the north, but the unique character of the liquid is definitely worth checking out. A notable difference is that many producers in the lowland region triple distill their whiskey. Talk about that in a minute. Um, a style typically... <laughs> Trying mo- hard not to riff. <laughs> <laughs> a style typically more associated with Irish whiskey than scotch. Uh, uh-huh. uh, points, by the way, to, to Jonah here for using whiskey without the E for scotch and whiskey with the E for Irish. He, he's, he knows what he's doing here. Some names you may have heard of include Ockentoshin, Bladnach, and Gervin, which produces grain whiskey for William Grant and Sons, as well as Hendrix Gin. Rosebank was a distillery in Falkirk, Scotland, that closed in 1993. Uh, oh, that's when Elijah was born, wasn't it? 93? Huh, is there a connection? Coincidence? <laughs> it's funny, you never see Elijah and Rosebank in the same room. <laughs> So it closed in 93, more than 150 years after it opened. There are various reasons for the closure, but essentially it was not considered financially viable to keep it running at the time. Over the years, parts of the property were converted into other businesses, and in 2008, large pieces of the metal were stolen from the stills, 
rendering them completely inoperable. But in 2017, independent company Ian McLeod Distillers, who also own Glen Goyne and Tamdu, by the way, uh, acquired the site and remaining stocks. And whiskey will once again flow from the distillery sometime next year, albeit via new stills. In the meantime, you can toast to Rosebank's new life with this 31-year-old single malt, a liquid that was taken from casks that were filled before it was mothballed. The whiskey is unpeated and bottled at 48.1% ABV. Tasting notes include, oh, I'm going to like this, lime, lemongrass, and coriander on the nose, followed by mint, berry, and banana bread on the palate. Indeed, this is unlike extra-aged whiskey you've tried from other regions. And according to distillery manager Malcolm Rennie, who we've mentioned many times in this podcast, uh, it's the first under his tenure and the last old Rosebank release before it opens again to the public. Rosebank 31-year-old will be available from the Rosebank website starting August 11. Um, and you, which by the time this is released, will be past that date. Uh, and you can find it. Models still available. <laughs> and you can find it at retailers in the UK. It'll be some time before we get to try new whiskey from the new distillery, but this taste from the past might offer some clues of what's to come. And there's your article, Jason. All right, let's take a quick break and come back for some well deserved riffing. Interestingly there, Joshua, as I was listening to that, it sounded a bit more like a press release. What was it about this Rob Report piece that you wanted to bring to our attention? Well, I, I, I want to say again that I really I liked this article and I really enjoyed Jonah's uh, coverage and his style. He really set a tone that I thought was, was cool. Um, However, there's something that he mentioned in here that's, that's not necessarily accurate. And there's so many misconceptions within the whiskey world that I, I want to make sure that it's, that it's clear, you know. So he had said that, the, that Lowlands are known for triple distilling. In fact, his words here are, A notable difference is that many producers in the Lowland region triple distill their whiskey, a style more associated with Irish whiskey than scotch. And to my knowledge, there was Rosebank, and we're going to talk about their distillation and condensation in a bit because that is quite unusual. And then there's Akintoshin. But, you know, you've, you've got distilleries like Glen Kinchy, which is not triple distilled. You've got Annandale. You've got uh, Loch Lee coming out. You've got Holyrood, the Glasgow distillery, right? There, maybe historically speaking, there were distilleries that were triple distilling and have you mm-hmm. know, been shuttered for for many years. And and maybe in that case, he is correct. I do, I I can't say off the top of my head. I I have an intimate understanding of all the lowland distilleries that once lived and are now gone. But as far as modern distillation goes, and by modern, I'm I'm talking maybe from the 80s till now, the majority of them have been double distilled just like everyone else. And and I would also go so far as to say that, you know, this idea of a lowland style whiskey is really an anachronism. It's it's you know, and I'd love for to hear your thoughts because you've been to Hollywood, right? And we've spoken with our friends at the Loch Lee Distillery, and and I'd argue that, and we've been to Annandale, right? And and I'd argue that Lowland distilleries don't really look like what we think of as Lowland distilleries. Yeah, I think for our One Nation Under Whiskey, where we spoke with John Campbell and David Ferguson. And and I'd seen David previously mention on an Impex deep dive mm. that they weren't coming out to make a regional style. Mm. 
Yeah. They were coming out to make Lockley whiskey. And Lockley whiskey would take the form of Lockley whiskey. Yeah. And I, and I and I thought it was quite an interesting comment when for us as as whiskey consumers, we've had a lot of reasons to avoid the lowlands for three decades, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and we've seen the lowland region shrinking. And now in the last few years, we've really seen the lowland region exploding. Mm-hmm. And in, in talking to uh, to Nick Ravenhall over at Holyrood and, and as you rightly say, the, the team over there as well, is they're just looking to make exciting whiskeys, you know, interesting grains, interesting yeasts, yeah, that's ways of bringing flavors together, uh, all distilled at, at the Holyrood distillery. And so... So yeah, I, I I think you you are spot on. Where it's it's a bit of an anachronism to to talk about this more delicate floral style, which is why, in listening to you reading this article, I'm quite excited to hear Rosebank claiming that. Right mm. at, at the time, you've got the new distilleries saying, "Hey, look, we might be geographically located here, but we're just here to make whiskey." <laughs> And then you've got Rosebank with a century and a half of production in Falkirk, just outside Edinburgh, yeah. saying, look, we know what we did back in the day and we know that we will do that again. Yeah, it's... It, so, A, I'm also excited because while, like you said, yes, the idea of Lowland Distillery is having a particular style is an anachronism. Rosebank is saying, hey, we're back, and what you've remembered us for is what we're going to do again. That is super cool, and I want to touch on that again. I just want to bring us quickly back to the idea of triple distilling and triple distilling potentially, or our understanding of it, equating to a lighter spirit. And all we have to do is think of Hazelburn, which is a triple distilled whiskey out of Campbelltown, and that is very heavy. Mortluck, which is, what, 2.78 times distilled, something like that, and that is a heavy spirit. So this idea that triple distillation equals lighter spirit, I, th- I think is very much you know, another misconception. Just because something is triple distilled doesn't mean you're making this lighter flavored spirit. There's so many other things that come into play starting all the way from the mashing you know through to maturation that can change the style so the fact that rosebank is coming to us saying we're going to have a lighter more floral style of whiskey i think is a nice call to the idea of of jason what what's going on in your uh, in the background there um, I decided while you were talking that I would just start up a leaf blower and start blowing it out the window. So if, if you're picking up any leaf blower uh, engine noise, that's me. Yeah. That's 100% me just cleaning up, cleaning the driveway. Don't you worry about it. Does the You just keep talking. Does it go from, from blow to suck? <laughs> Funny, it doesn't look druish. Anyway, so I really like this idea that Rosebank is is saying they're going to come to the market with a lighter, more floral style of spirit. But again, back to the comparison to Hazelburn coming out of Springbank as a triple distilled spirit. Rosebank similarly will be a triple distilled spirit, and both distilleries condense that spirit through worm tubs, which give you this sort of heavier style of liquid. So I wonder if we could talk about that for a little bit, because that's, you know, you can see why people can be a bit confused as to where style comes from. Well, and and I think with someone like Rosebank, you're talking a light spirit with a heavy texture. Mm-hmm. And... It's interesting, actually. You and I talked about this just a few months ago, where on our flavometer we have yeah. floral. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we have we have room for floral, and we almost never use it. Mm-hmm. And then 
in the rare occasions that we do get to use that 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 qualifier we're only putting a few notches on it mm. and i and there's there's I don't know if we're not seeing a lot of floral whiskies on offer, or, or whether we've been we've been damaged by by FWP, and so floral only counts when it's you know blowing your brains out, mm. and you know, and so to think of floral being active, to have it be a a, a design aspect of a single malt. I I think it'll be good. It'll be good to see how it plays out. And even when you were reading some of those tasting notes there, like I, I know they were talking berries and I and I think I might have heard you say cardamom in there as well. Are there were there designated floral notes happening there? No, not not in the tasting notes that he gave. Well let me you know what, let me read it once more. Like you and I say things like summer meadow or you know fresh meadow in the morning or fresh dew on a summer meadow and th- this is running with things like lime lemongrass coriander all, all delicious mint berry banana yeah. bread on the palate so like, sure mint grows but i would think more of an herbaceousness from the mint yeah i like all of those notes that they said told me herbaceous rather than floral. And so I'm going to do something a bit different. So I oh. I wrote a review on Two Rose Banks back in Ju- on June 13th, 2011. And I'm going to read them <laughs> to you. actually it's, it's it's one rose bank. That sorry, it's one rose bank. And and this was a 19-year-old from um from an ex-bourbon cask. And oh. What's the distillation year? Uh, so it was 19 years old in 2011. Okay. Oof. 11s and 19s, those are tough to work out. What are we looking at? 1992. 1992, sure. So <laughs> on the note, so here we go. And it was 60.8% alcohol. <laughs> oh, 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 right? oh, yes, please. <laughs> um, and it says on the nose, a lightly fruited... Nose, think pear and pineapple, with hints of herbal teas. Right, so herbal teas, we're in that area, right? Yeah. Uh, White pepper and even some notes of sweet hay. Milk chocolate and a touch of light caramel. Uh, Nice notes I often find in rose banks. So uh, apparently in 2011, I had had a few rose banks. I just didn't happen to... This is the only rose bank I reviewed on my website way back when. So anyway... Back to the fruits now, same as before. What amazes me is how easily at 60.8% ABV this could be nosed. You'd think this is a low ABV whiskey. Ready for this? Ready for this? Yeah, texture, right? Nasal texture. (laughs) Rose petals and sugared and honeyed chamomile. That closes out my Mm. my nose notes, all right? Um, On the mouth, bright, effervescent, and loaded with lemon fizz candies, over-sugared applesauce, lemon, 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 and lemons. Did I mention lemons? How about lemons? Oh, wait, lemons. (laughs) More white pepper, and now some white bread toast. (laughs) And then then the finish, juicy fruit gum, like dead on, more white pepper and sugar cane, sugar cane, um lasting peppery finish and then i always summed it up say in some a very one-sided whiskey but one that is so easily consumed perhaps Mm -hmm. as an aperitif or a midday pick-me-up or a late summer relaxer so it sounds kind of bright and penetrating with lemon but then not a lot of development around that it seems, especially when you yeah. say aperitif yeah w- w- without a doubt and you know granted this is a single cask fr- yeah. right yeah. from from an independent bottler not necessarily highlighting what the distillery wants to show and yeah you know i can often re i i always took and you taught me this before i read the book but i always took michael jackson's 
suggestions of there's always nice things to be said. But sometimes I can read between my lines and know where I'm kind of like, you know, sticking an elbow. And I don't think I stuck any elbows anywhere, you know. It was just sort of a nice, pleasant, light whiskey. But I also, as you're talking there about the increased strength on that, also makes me think of another distillery that uses worm tubs in Craigellachie where we've experienced some higher ABVs and found them very palatable, uh, both on the, you know, I say palatable, maybe I mean accessible, Mm. both on the nose and on the palate, because you have that texture coming through. You have those oils present. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, I keep, I know you you bring up the example of Kregelike, and I think that that's a good one, but it, it makes me think back to the Hazelburn idea, back to the triple distillation in worm tubs. But I am keeping Kregelke in the back of my mind here. Again, there are so many variables that equate to what does this whiskey taste like? And it could be how it's fermented. You know, if you think Spring Bank, their wash is typically four and a half, five and a half percent ABV whereas many other distilleries are 8, 9, 10% ABV. So you have a variance there. And then we also don't know where they're taking their cuts, right? A higher hearts cut Mm -hmm. could equate to a lighter spirit, just like we talk about, you know, the differences between Kilhoman and Ard Bag, who are basically using the same peated barley that they get from Port Ellen Maltings, but Kilhoman comes across as light, fruity, citrusy, and our bag comes across as heavier and ashy, and, and we're just dealing with subtle differences in fermentation and distillation. So, you know, I, I, I think, in my opinion, A, I'm excited by this. Any distillery reopening, I think, is fantastic, especially one that is as legendary as Rosebank. But I am curious to dig a little deeper to find out the whys and what fours that make this that, you know, quote unquote, lighter, more floral style or quote unquote, lowland style of whiskey, you know? Well, just to kind of bring our, our floral conversation full circle, floral doesn't necessarily mean flowers. Uh, yes. To me, yeah. in, in, in listening to, to floral in other places, it, it can mean lime, right? It could be that brightness mm. of citrus could have a, a certain florality to it. And so it's a bit like when we reconsidered our use of rich on the flavometer, mm. I think Balancer had written in asking about that. And, and I think floral can mean quite effusive in the glass. And I know you talked about the effervescence on the palate of yeah. the rose bank that you yep. were tasting there. Yep. But I also wonder about that kind of effervescence on the nose, a, a brightness. So you're equating floral to simply mean lighter and brighter, where where I'm taking it a, a bit more on face value. And I think I would venture a guess that more people would do what I'm doing Rather than what you're doing, and I don't know that either one is is correct or incorrect, but I, I do I do think it's interesting. So why are you equating floral to citrus and to that effusive quality? Because because just in your review there, where you talked about the the honeyed chamomile, mm. right? And I, I I think yes, that's a very floral note. Sure. Yeah. Chamomile and and bags of chamomile are are very floral. But then I'm thinking about Jonah's article there with the tasting notes that I assume come from the distillery. There wasn't one note from the distillery that you would say, oh, that's floral. But you would say that's bright and effusive. Lemongrass. Would you say lemongrass was floral? Yeah, that's a a (laughs) tough one, right? It's like it's herbaceous and citrusy. and right. Right then, it goes in with the mint that then came on the palate. So, yeah. I, you know, it's not striking me that floral needs to be a straight up florality. But I do, I do wonder who's wording 
that is. Is that Jonah's wording? Is that Rosebank's wording? Right? Like, like the Balveni talks about them being the honeyed malt. You know, does Rosebank mm-hmm. want to talk about themselves as being the light and floral malt? And if that's the case, then, you know, I would love to hear from them. What is their key note? If you go to their website, they talk floral all across their website. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, yes, it's very much their work. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it'll be interesting. You know, I, I read really quickly because I know we're getting close to our 35 minute marker here. Real close to our tight 35. <laughs> 35, that's it. Um, I read another article, I think it was the Whiskey Wash, where they showed the actual stills being installed. And that was in March of 2022. And then mm-hmm. I met up with Gordon Dundas, uh, who's with Ian McLeod Distillers. Um, and he was talking about Rosebank. And I, th- if memory serves, I think he said spirit started running. Have they perfected it? I don't know. I've got a, I, I think it's worth reaching out to Gordon again, maybe get a, an official update on Rosebank. Yeah, I think yeah. I would like that for One Nation Under Whiskey. I would hazard a guess our listeners would like that for One Nation Under Whiskey. So there you go. let's see if we can make that happen. All right, I'll work on it. All right, let's get out of here on that then. If you'd like to drop us an email, questions at onenationunderwhiskey.com or simply use the info account, info at singlecastnation.com. We already know what we're covering in the next Extra Extra, but you'll have to tune in to see what that is. Until then, peace. Peace. All right, should yep. we jump in? I'm ready. Ready to Hello. rock. Hello. Ready? Doing it? Yeah. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, dear Just listeners. Start it whenever and you want to start it. Welcome to the latest <laughs> episode of Extra Extra. This is all about Joshua talking over Jason. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.